All right, we can get started. Uh, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Craig Jordan. I've had the, the pleasure of taking over as one of the moderators for the, for the DOM series this year, as Sean and Holt Cole going to step down. So it's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker this morning, Dr. Christopher Evans from the Pulmonary Division, also with a joint appointment in the Immunology Department here at the University of Colorado. Chris did his MD PhD at Johns Hopkins University, followed by postdoctoral work at the Texas Medical Center uh, involved with both Baylor and, um, and MD Anderson. In two, from 2005 to 2011, he served in, as an assistant professor uh, at MD Anderson, followed by his recruitment to the University of Colorado in 2011, where he um, has risen up to the ranks of the associate professor level. Um, Chris has a really wonderful um, academic uh, career thus far. He's been very active in sort of all aspects of what make a, a great academic uh, noticeable, uh, very well-funded um, speaking engagements really um, all over the country, um, multiple mentees and educational opportunities as well as a, a robust um, academic and research program. So obviously today he has the provocative title telling us a little bit about unexpected roles of mucus. Chris, thank you for being right. here. Thanks so much. Yeah, I hate putting in these jokes about flavors when people are eating lunch and, and thinking about the taste of mucus, but it's, it's it's hard to restrain myself. Now, this is a picture from the top of Mount Bierstadt. Uh, uh, went on a hike up there a couple years ago, and, and it was a really pretty picture. Uh, out here in the distance, uh, the thing that looks like a, uh, a whale hump, that's uh, Pikes Peak down there. So it's, it's a, it was a pretty day where it was cloudy over Denver and, and sunny on the, that side of the ridge. Uh, so since this is a mixed audience, I thought I'd start with the Captain Obvious picture here, which is... Uh, to tell you what the lung is for primarily, it's, it's gas exchange. So the intake of oxygen, the uh, uh, release of carbon dioxide, uh, and air passes through these tubes of the tracheobronchial and bronchiolar uh, airway generations and down to the alveoli. Uh, and what I'd like to highlight here is at the alveolar level, this is an extraordinarily thin layer here. So it's less than one micron thick. You can see a blood, uh, a blood vessel with a capillary in it here. Uh, so the diffusion of oxygen across here uh, is maintained by how uh, thin and delicate that surface is. Uh, but it becomes more susceptible to injury than, uh, than, than one might like. Uh, so they always have developed numerous ways of maintaining defense uh, against foreign objects as well as uh, controlling inflammatory responses that may disrupt homeostasis. Uh, so to that end, uh, whether we're outside in nature or, or in the city, uh, we're exposed to tons of microbial uh, insults uh, and, and, and particle insults. Uh, these include uh, uh, allergens, uh, microbial agents, as well as pollutants. Uh, and just to put these in perspective, uh, if you think of a tidal breath, just for round numbers, uh, half a liter uh, per breath, and this number of breaths per minute, and this number of minutes per day, you, you take about 12,000 liters of air into the lungs on a daily basis. So it's a, a pretty massive volume. Uh, and when you take into account that within that 12,000 liters, there's approximately 10 to 20 million particles per liter uh, and uh, if you can do the math and extrapolate per day, there's 100 to 200 billion particle exposure to the respiratory tract on a daily basis. A fraction of these are microbes, uh, and again, you can kind of see the math as it works out here to hundreds of thousands to millions of microbes uh, that can end up in the airways uh, in, in any given period of time. Uh, so to that end, the lung has developed a, a system of primary and secondary innate defense mechanisms that can be used to maintain homeostasis uh, and at the, while they do that, though, uh, to do so without causing massive inflammatory responses and exaggerated responses that might somehow damage the tissue and compromise the host. A first layer of defense is the epithelium. And uh, as that primary barrier, the epithelial barrier is shown here in a mouse trachea, this uh, a freeze fracture SEM. Uh, and you can see that the uh, surface of the epithelium uh, contains this blanket of mucus. Uh, and these cells right here are ciliated cells that project up into the mucus and allow for clearance of uh, things that become trapped in that mucus blanket, uh, where they can then be eliminated by either expectoration or swallowing. Again, another tasty lunch subject. Uh, as particles impart into the lungs, uh, the other stereotypical uh, mechanism of defense that's been, uh, that, that's, you know, again, in all the textbooks, uh, is the alveolar macrophage. So these are just pictures of alveoli down here, and you can see a macrophage uh, uh, there in that picture of an alveolar duct. And the alveolar macrophage also helps to provide defense in this sense, against very, very small particles that don't impact upon airway surfaces and get down deeper into the lungs, as well as particles that might uh, just collect their, over longer periods of time and bacteria that may grow. Uh, in this case, the alveolar macrophage is very capable of eating, phagocytosing, um, uh, and killing organisms 
Uh, and it, it, in, in that sense, it's also very restrained from inducing inflammatory responses uh, upon exposures. The classic example I showed you there, the alveolar macrophage is, is again, what's, what's in all the textbooks. What's a little bit less appreciated is that the macrophages are present all over the airways. Uh, this is a rat trachea. And uh, you can see airway epithelia here. You can see ciliated cells mixed in with non-ciliated cells. Uh, and these white specks here, these are macrophages. And you can see on this portion over here, the macrophages are covered in a mucus blanket. So there's a physical interaction between the two systems, the primary layer of, of mucus uh, and, and a secondary backup line of defense, the macrophage. And we're interested in exploring how these two interact, and in that sense, how they can maintain homeostasis, uh, but how can they can protect against pathophysiological situations. And again, when these things go wrong, a lot of damage can occur. So when mucus hypersecretion occurs, such as an asthma, uh, airway plugging and obstruction is a, is a phenomenon that's well known. Uh, I used asthma as an example, but you can also see in COPD, cystic fibrosis, and then other diseases. Uh, and then as a second layer of this, though, when mucus is not cleared properly or is produced uh, in a dysregulated fashion, inflammatory responses that usually require the mucus layer to help them be under control and to be cleared out can be exaggerated. Bacteria may accumulate, as seen in CF or, or, uh, or, or COPD. Uh, and inflammatory cells may be altered in their ability to be eliminated from the lungs. And then that said, in the chronic settings, uh, you can have a situation in which mucus dysfunction can also cause uh, long-term structural remodeling in the lungs. Uh, and so in this situation, uh, it was an example here is in uh, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, with a diagram here showing that uh, with the excessive mucus that's being produced in very small airways, uh, there's a, uh, a prevalence for uh, fiber proliferative changes that can occur. So in this sense, what I've uh, highlighted here is that there's a, a balance that needs to happen for homeostasis and pathophysiology in which mucus and the particles are either cleared or they always get plugged. Uh, the lung is either defended or becomes chronically inflamed, uh, or situations occur in which it can be uh, repaired and homeostasis restored, uh, or you can have remodeling, and, and remodeling in this case uh, can result in devastating consequences. So how do we address this? You know, we've talked about mucus and made the off-color jokes about it, uh, but really what it comes down to is that there's a handful of genes that encode the mucin glycoproteins that are present within airway mucus. Uh, the ones that have been uh, shown to be expressed in the lungs, at least at some level, are MUC2, MUC5AC, MUC5B, and MUC19. Uh, this is mouse lung, uh, it's qPCR from a mouse lung. And you can see that MUC5AC and MUC5B are the predominant species present. Uh, this is a log two scale, so these are, are, are many-fold higher. Uh, than each of these uh, less abundantly expressed uh, isoforms. Uh, but you can see that at baseline, MUC5B is predominant, and MUC5AC is lower, uh, but under inflammatory conditions, in this case in an asthma model, MUC5AC can be induced. And it turns out that this 40 to 50-fold induction of MUC5AC puts it to equal levels of MUC with MUC5B. So you have two mucins, 5AC and 5B. And based on that, we've decided to explore them uh, using genetic tools to be able to address how they function. Uh, so in the baseline state, as I showed you, MUC5B is produced, MUC5AC is low, and in the allergic setting, uh, they're both present. There's a little bit of an increase in MUC5B. It's about twofold, which is consistent with what you see in the qPCR before, uh, but a robust induction of MUC5AC. Based on this, we took MUC5AC knockout mice and exposed them to an allergen, and we tested whether or not they had an airflow obstructive phenotype that's consistent with asthma. Uh, so in a wild-type mouse, the plus-plus uh, line shown here with the black dots, the allergic mouse shows exaggerated responses to methacholine. Uh, methacholine is an agonist that causes bronchoconstriction but also causes mucin secretion. Uh, and the methacholine responses that you can see in the allergic mouse are potentiated over uh, the non-allergic wild-type mouse. Uh, but you can see that the MUC5AC knockout here, this minus, minus in pink, uh, is protected from that exaggerated response to methacholine. So it's protected from airway hyperactivity consistent with the protection from the asthma phenotype. And it turns out that this protection came uh, with a, uh, a restoration of, of airway opening uh, and a, uh, a loss of airway plugging that's seen in the wild-type mouse. In this same context, though, inflammation was not affected, right? So this is, uh, if we look over here at this balb C A O E column over here, uh, the numbers of eosinophils, which are zero in a uh, saline challenge mouse, are indistinguishable in the, uh, the knockout mice. Uh, we did the same experiment in multiple strains of mice and with multiple allergens. But I just wanted to point out that MUC5AC does not appear in this setting uh, with a chronic allergen exposure to affect inflammation and the control of inflammation. Instead, it seems to play a, a bigger role in obstruction. 
So more of a physical role than an uh, inflammatory role. So this starts to get us thinking about how these things function. So we've talked about which genes are there, which ones might be involved in a uh, pathophysiological response. But we really want to get down to the nuts and bolts of how they work. We have to think about them at a structural level. Uh, so these models up here are MUC5AC and MUC5B apoproteins. Uh, they have von Willebrand factor-like domains in their N and C termini. These form disulfide bonds that cause these things to link together in very large polymers. Uh, a single dimer of this uh, is about one micron long, and these things can make 10 to 100 mer uh, length uh, pieces. So it can be extremely large molecules in the, uh, uh, in, in the airway surfaces. They're held together by disulfide bonds. There's another area of, of internal disulfide bonds that we don't really know exactly what they do. It's thought that they help regulate the mesh pore size of, of mucus gels. Uh, but then the other business end of, of the, the mucin, and really what makes it different than almost any other protein in the body, is it's heavy glycosylation. Uh, so it's serine and threonine residues. It gets core glycosylated. These glycans can be elaborated with the addition of glycnac and galna, uh, galactose residues. And termini, uh, termini that include sialic acid and fucose residues as well. So you have some specialized sugars that can get uh, added onto it. Uh, I'll come back to these later on in the talk. Uh, but what I'd like to do right now is to, uh, uh, to focus on that first end here, the, the, the disulfide end. And in our asthma model, we ask the question, well, if you, if you form these big plugs and you have this really big molecule, what happens if you can break it up? And so we collaborated with a group uh, that was a, a spin-off company uh, started by Rick Boucher at University of North Carolina. Uh, and we tried using a mucolytic agent that this company uh, had, had, had generated. Uh, so Leslie Morgan, who's a graduate student working in my lab, uh, has taken mice that are uh, exposed to an allergen, in this case AOE, uh, and that, that stands for Aspergillus oryzae extract. And they were either exposed to the allergen and then methacholine, uh, and then treated, in this case, with saline. So this mouse was challenged and inflamed, uh, but it didn't receive this drug. Uh, and the drug has a, a sort of jargony name, so it doesn't really help to, to understand that at this point. Uh, but the drug was given in pulses at each of these points between methacholine doses that were being administered IV. And you can see that the mouse that had been challenged but not received the drug had an exaggerated response to mice that were not challenged. And the mice that received the mucolytic agent were protected from airway hyperresponsiveness to methacholine. In fact, their levels resembled that that was seen in uh, MUC5AC knockout mice. So she repeated those studies in this case with the IV methacholine challenge. And it turns out that the protection that she was seeing with this mucolytic agent was associated with a disruption of mucus polymer uh, size. Uh, so as I was saying before, the very high molecular mucin polymers, they can be seen here. Uh, this is an agarose gel that's run overnight. Uh, the, most of the material that you're looking at here has migrated less than a centimeter into the gel. Uh, and so these, these very large proteins can be seen in mice that were treated with vehicle, in this case saline. Uh, but mice that were treated with the drug show disruption of the mucus polymers. Uh, and that's consistent, again, with protection from airway hyperresponsiveness. And Les is in the process now of going through and doing quantitative histology to look for plugs in the airways and, uh, and to complete that, uh, that portion of the study. So we talked about MUC5AC and its role in plugging, uh, but what about MUC5B? You know, it's sitting here at baseline at very, very high levels, and what we wondered is, is, is how does this function and what does it do? And MUC5B is a protein that's involved in mucociliary clearance. So when we look at MUC5B knockout mice and compare them to MUC5AC knockout mice, there's a significant impairment in mucociliary clearance function. It's defined here as MCC. Uh, so in this case, particles are instilled into the lungs, and we looked at their elimination over time. Uh, and there's a dramatic impairment in the MUC5B knockout mouse. That loss of clearance is associated with an accumulation of bacteria in the lungs. So this figure here, what I'm showing is mice that were sacked at three months or six months of age, and we called them healthy in that they were not dead. And in this case, they, uh, they showed that they were, uh, uh, had increased accumulation of bacteria in the lungs, uh, but then we did check on mice that were becoming mostly dead. Uh, we were able to see that there was even in a higher level of, uh, of, of uh, bacteria that were found in the lungs. And so in this case, we have an expansion of bacterial uh, uh, colonization or infection in the airways, uh, and that was consistent with a loss of life phenotype. Uh, so in this case, the knockout mice are shown here in red, and you can see over time uh, they, uh, they petered off. Uh, but when we put mice on antibiotics starting at, uh, at weaning, uh, that's the green line across here. Uh, we protected them against uh, the uh, lethal phenotype. Turns out that these associations that we're seeing here, or in this case, the, the causative nature of the infection, uh, is associated uh, with chronic inflammatory uh, 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 settings. And again, it makes a lot of sense, considering that you have a, a bacteria accumulating in lungs. Uh, 
Uh, what we see is that over time that there was increased macrophages, neutrophils, and other cell types, including even a few eosinophils, uh, present in the lungs of, of the mice, uh, even those that survived out to, uh, to longer, uh, longer lives. Uh, so we started to think about how could there be a functional link between these. So there's an association between the numbers, uh, but what happens to the cells themselves? And one of the most striking things that we'd seen was just a simple cytospin, where we were able to look and see that by three months, and, and, and in this case in the surviving mice, by 12 months, uh, you could see that the macrophages don't look good. They look, in this case, angry, or in this case, exhausted. Uh, and that phenotypic, uh, morphologic uh, uh, finding was associated with uh, loss of function. Uh, so their phagocytic activity was decreased, uh, and it turns out that they were also uh, uh, apoptotic in many cases. So there was a loss of macrophage function uh, and survival in this case as well. So we're at the point now where we have mucociliary clearance and we have a complex phenotype. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a mucus blanket. We have mucociliary clearance from a distal to proximal airway unit. We have a molecule. We have sugars. We have, we have a lot of complex phenotypes, and they're really hard to explain how you, how you can kill a mouse in this case. Uh, and, and it doesn't really help to try to think of it at a complex level. Uh, and so what we've done since then, and, and this is partly inspired by a talk that uh, Ruslan Medzitov gave here uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago now, uh, and, and what she said, well, you know, take this whole complex system and break it down like an engineer would. And what he said was, take it, take it think about it as a machine. So you have a machine with a set point, uh, as well as a controller, actuator, and, and some sort of control object, so something you can manipulate, and that's how, what helps you regulate output. And if this control object feeds back to the controller through a sensor, you have a way of controlling the system and regulating output. Again, at any point along the way, though, if you disrupt these components, you can break things out. So taking this analogous setting, what I've done is, is said, okay, well, let's, let's look at it in this case. So we have homeostasis and we have defense. Uh, defense could be disease if we, if we drive any of these wrong. Uh, and in this case, we have our, our barriers that are our, our ways of regulating the set point. Uh, we expose mice to challenges, or they're challenged by their uh, normal environmental stimuli. Uh, and I, I said the control objects in this case are the two mucins we're looking at, muc 5 b and muc 5 ac And they're involved in the potential to be able to control and regulate the resolution of challenges to maintain defense. So you can go in this direction and have defense, or you can go in this direction and maintain barrier or phagocytic function. So in that setting, then, you can have a situation in which you have the absence of inflammation, so you have your barrier, mucociliary, and, and, and phagocytic defenses. You can have a transient response, which is really what you want. You want this thing to come in and go away as best as you can. You can have a situation in which you chronically challenge these and you start to overwhelm the system, but the system figures out how to tweak itself and tolerate a, a chronic uh, exposure. Uh, and then you can have a situation in which any of these components fail, uh, resulting in disease. So that said, looking at the mucins, in this case what we've done is to take and develop an a, a improved model of MUC5B deficiency, this using a conditional knockout. And we used a lung-specific knockout, and we're able to uh, isolate macrophages from them and perform microarrays on them. Uh, and lo and behold, there's a, a whole host of microbial, uh, or antimicrobial, but as well as inflammatory um, ex uh, markers that are differentially expressed in the macrophage. This really doesn't tell us a, a ton specifically, but it does tell us that there is a quantitative and, and appreciable difference between the wild type and the, and the MUC5B null setting. So in the absence of the mucin, you do reprogram macrophages uh, uh, in this manner. So coming back then to this model, uh, I, I moved away a bit from the, uh, the, the disulfide components because it doesn't seem to make a, a ton of sense uh, if we're going to look at a direct interaction. It could make a sense in, in terms of mucociliary clearance, the removal or elimination of dead cells and things like that. Uh, but what we started to hone in on is the sugars. And in this case, we're interested in a particular family of sugars, and that's the sialic acids that get attached to galactose in the termini. And the sialic acids uh, come in two major linkages in non-neuronal tissue, so the alpha-2-3 and alpha-2-6 linkages that are depicted here. And they can be detected using lectins as well as other uh, uh, higher, uh, higher resolution uh, assays. Uh, but in this case, using the Machiamarensis lectin, uh, MAL-2, what we're able to show is that MUC5B is selectively silylated in alpha-2-3 linkage. Uh, so we have uh, uh, an absence in the knockout mouse here of silo, uh, uh, silo detection, uh, but it's still present in MUC5AC knockout mice. MUC5B is there, MUC5B is not there in the knockout, 
Uh, but you can see that in the presence of Mach 5b, you still have some elevation in the Mach 5ac deficient setting, showing that Mach 5b is selectively and somewhat specifically sialylated in this setting. And the consequences of that is that alpha-2,3 sialocytes are actually uh, important regulators of, of, of inflammation. And it turns out that the, uh, there's a family of proteins called SIGLEX, which essentially stands for sialic acid binding protein, so it's sialic acid immunoglobulin-like lectin receptors. Uh, and these SIGLEX uh, are able to bind preferentially to different conformations of sialicide residues. And in this case, SIGLEX F is selected for MUC5B. And it turns out that the uh, ability of MUC5B to bind to SIGLEX F drives eosinophil apoptosis. Uh, so if mice uh, were uh, uh, treated with IL-13 uh, and eosinophils were isolated, we were able to show that in the absence of MUC5B, uh, there was a loss of eosinophil apoptosis in the lungs. Uh, in an in vitro setting, if you just purify eosinophils from the mice and you add mucins purified from uh, 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 tracheal epithelial cell cultures, you can also induce apoptosis. So through a gain of function and loss of function, we're able to show this. Uh, and in the in vivo context, we've uh, gone further and uh, explored other asthma phenotypes in them. And, uh, I'm giving a talk tomorrow for the pulmonary RIP, and I'll, I'll spend more time on that. Uh, but for the sake of today, I want to come back to the macrophage. Uh, and the macrophage is the other major expressor of SIGLEC F in the mouse. Uh, and it turns out that this expression uh, is linked to inhibitory signal transduction pathways, including phosphatase uh, pathways such as SHIP. Uh, and the ability to do this, we hypothesize, can control inflammatory responses, as well as possibly control phagocytosis. Uh, we're going to concentrate on uh, inflammatory responses here. Uh, I'm talking TLR, uh, in this case, is a, a, a generic term, uh, but we will be using LPS to test in, uh, macrophage responsiveness uh, in, in experiments I'm going to show. Uh, and the idea here is that the uh, control of homeostasis involves a MUC5B SIGLEC F signaling axis that becomes dysfunctional during inflammation, uh, but is then required for restoration uh, and resolution of, of lung health. Uh, to that end, if we get rid of the ligand, in this case, using our conditional knockout mouse and using a temporally regulated version of it, uh, we can show that when we induce a CRE, in this case, a tamoxifen-regulated CRE, uh, we can see that over time, we can deplete the lungs of MUC5B. And in that same setting, neutrophilia starts to occur in the lungs spontaneously. Again, so they start losing MUC5B. They may are losing mucociliary clearance, probably. We haven't measured it. Uh, they are possibly being exposed to more uh, microbial antigens that live around longer or, or endogenous particles. Uh, but in this case, at least in a phenotypic sense, there's a consistency with the loss of the ligand and the gain of inflammation. And in that same setting, if we get rid of SIG like F, uh, we also see that there's a mild but spontaneous neutrophilia that occurs. So again, this is in the, in the homeostatic setting. Uh, and so this is work that we've been doing collaboratively with Bill Jansen, and uh, he and I just got an R01 funded to, uh, uh, to take this further. So a lot of the data I'm going to show today is preliminary because it, it had been used up until now to, uh, to, to uh, as grant pre, uh, preliminary data. So in order to explore these more mechanistically, what we do is we take uh, macrophages from the lungs of mice, throw them in a dish, and then stimulate them with LPS. And, and think of it sort of like an AHR type of challenge in, in, a, in an asthma clinic where somebody inhales methacholine and you see what the responsiveness is. If the macrophage is, is trigger happy, if you put LPS onto it, it's going to respond more than a, a macrophage that's at rest. So in this setting, what we can do is we can take macrophages, put them in a dish, leave them sitting for half an hour to allow them to selectively adhere, uh, and then stimulate them with LPS for four to 24 hours. And we can also mix in inhibitors and, and other uh, uh, components as well. So in the uh, setting of, of MUC5B absence, what we find is that if we take the MUC5B conditional knockout mice, throw them in addition, throw LPS on them, uh, they're trigger happy. So they release more IL-1, KC, and, and IL-6 than wild type. And also there's an overexpressing line that uh, David Schwartz's group made that we also threw in there for, for good measure. And it turns out that they're suppressed somewhat compared to uh, the wild type. So there may be a level of protection conferred by having a lot of MUC5B around. In this same setting, if we take wild-type macrophages and then we throw a cross-linking antibody uh, that can cross-link and activate cyclic F, uh, we can suppress LPS-induced IL-6 and IL-1 beta production. So we have a loss of function and a gain of function, uh, showing at both the ligand and the receptor level that there's a pathway that can be utilized between MUC5B and cyclic F to control homeostatic programming of the macrophage. So what happens during inflammation? If we put LPS into the mouse, turns out that the knockout mouse 
uh, has macrophages that show exaggerated LPS responses. In this case, I'm showing IL-6 and TNF. And if we look at mice that were treated, in this case, with a, uh, an activating sick F antibody in vivo, uh, we found that there was at least a mild suppression of neutrophilia. It's significant, but there's so much other things going on in terms of the epithelial drive uh, components to inflammatory responses that it doesn't surprise me that you wouldn't turn everything off. Uh, but again, if you live and die by the p-value, it's, it's something to, uh, to put in a grant. Uh, as we look at this further, we're growing knockout mice that breed poorly and trying to, uh, uh, to really tease these out and, uh, and, and do this in a more robust fashion. Uh, but the other part of the uh, situation that we're interested in is, is the resolution of inflammation. So as inflammation is induced, there's a peak period of neutrophilia that occurs within one to three days, and then macrophages that are resident cells are shown in the lungs here. They, they kind of bump up and then restore back to baseline. But there's a whole recruited monocyte population that comes into the lungs. Uh, and Bell's group has shown that you can characterize these by CD11B and CD11C expression. In this setting, the uh, CD11C po positive recruited cells are more pro-inflammatory, and it turns out that they lack cyclic F. So when they come into the lungs, they have very little cyclic F. As they arise into the lungs and sit there over time, uh, they do start to express it a little bit. Uh, and it's thought that perhaps, and again, thinking in, in terms of uh, hypothesis, it's not encumbered by the presence of actual data, uh, but it's thought that this may be a mechanism by which monocyte recruitment is turned off. And that may be a way of inducing uh, apoptosis in them. Again, that's, those are all experiments that we proposed and are, are, are getting ready to do now. Uh, and so the, um, uh, the last phase of this then is, is you know, what are the roles of these guys and, and the resolution of inflammation? And so if we look six days after exposure to LPS or microbial challenge, uh, we find in the absence of MUC5AC, we have high levels of inflammation. And if we put in the cyclic F activating antibody, we can suppress inflammation and, and help to bring homeostasis back a little faster. So I'm going to end uh, this portion here, the, this last little bit here, uh, by just saying that there is a human correlate to everything that we're doing here. Uh, so this is a human airway, uh, and it's uh, labeled here. Uh, Adrian Stefanski did this. It's labeled here with a, uh, that MAL2 lectin, and you can see that MUC5B uh, and, and alpha 23 are, are closely linked. If we use another lectin to look for alpha 2 sixes, you can see that they're separated. So alpha 2 3 silylation of MUC5B is a, a characteristic of human bronchiolar airways. Uh, and Siglex, in this case, macrophages, uh, this is work that Bill and Leah did. Uh, they express Siglex 9, which is our, our top candidate Siglex for the, uh, the human alveolar macrophage. Uh, so, so coming back to the system, what I propose here is that MUC5B plays an important role in resolution uh, through its interaction as a barrier and, and, and regulator of phagocytosis. Uh, and so that I'll end up with the model there. Uh, and then I'm going to end with a, a very final shout out here to, uh, to make a room for Sean here, uh, which is that this property that we're looking at in the lungs is shared in the gut. Uh, so I talked about the mucin sugars earlier. Uh, it turns out fucose and sialic acid are both the, uh, the, the sugars that terminate uh, specialized mucin glycoproteins. Uh, microbes use the, uh, the sugars that are on there. So they use fucose in this case. Uh, and this is work from um, 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 uh, Jeff Gordon's group. Uh, showing that fucose sensing by uh, bacteroides beta iodomicron is used to control uh, the expression of a whole host of genes, I think one was named by Marvin Schwartz, uh, that regulate quorum sensing and the growth of uh, competing bacteria in the gut. Uh, so that's one way in, this, uh, in which this is used. Uh, and the other is that a similar pattern to what I was just showing you with the macrophage in the lung uh, is utilized by MUC2, the intestinal mucin, uh, through fucose and other residues uh, that activate and control dendritic cell uh, tolerance-inducing properties. Uh, so that, that uh, it appears that this is a consistent and, and conserved pathway for regulation uh, between mucins and phagocytic barriers. Uh, so on that, I'd like to end and, and thank the people who did all the work. Uh, this was us at our lab retreat last year. Uh, uh, there was a lot of business discussed at the time. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I'll leave it to uh, questions and, and make room for Sean here. It is not, and I think it's a good question. So um, a lot of pathogens have a lot of these sugars on their surfaces already, so whether they compete or somehow interact, it, it's, it's not clear. They also have a lot of lectins for the mucin, so it may be bug dependent. I try to avoid the microbial ecology as much as I can just because it's going to change bug by bug. <laughs>
Um, but it is a good question. Okay, um, so we have done a, uh, a recent study, and I didn't, I didn't bring any of the slides here, but we've, uh, we've taken MUC5AC mice and tested them in both KRAS and urethane models of lung cancer and find that in both settings, the absence of MUC5AC is protective. Um, and it appears that there's something going on with the macrophages, at least in numbers. Uh, we haven't gone and phenotyped the macrophages, but that's something we'd like to be able to do. Um, but also the change in mucin expression in that setting could affect other intracellular components, such as ER stress and things like that, that might be uh, affecting the way the adenocarcinoma cells grow. So it, that said, the background is that adenocarcinomas are, are, are pretty good producers of MUC5AC. Um, there's some human correlates to go with it, and that MUC5AC expression levels correlate with survival uh, negatively in the case of patients who have a KRAS mutation and lung cancer. Uh, they show uh, worsened five-year survival uh, and disease-free survival uh, compared to uh, those that have uh, lower levels of, of MUC5AC production. Uh, but it's all bets are off in EGFR mutants. Uh, they, they just it's MUC5AC independent. Yes, um, and I, I'd say the gut, uh, the, the papers that I, I showed one figure of uh, at the end there, um, the control of that is, 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 is interesting, and that, that takes place in the small intestine where uh, in the presence of MUC2, when you expose dendritic cells to foreign antigens, ovalbumin, as well as LPS and other pro-inflammatory uh, uh, factors, uh, in the presence of MUC2, and specifically through its glycans, uh, that causes DCs to, uh, uh, to tell naive lymphocytes to become Tregs. And so that's thought to be one of the main mechanisms that keeps you from becoming allergic to, to most of the food that you take in. Uh, and so some sort of dysfunction in there could, could play a role in food allergy. Um, that's certainly where the people who are doing that are going. Yeah, sorry. Unanswered questions later. Actually, I have to go to oh, okay. pulmonary <laughs> fellows. Right. Well, you know how to find them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's a, why don't you give it a shot? Yeah. So it's a, it's a special pleasure to, to introduce Sean Colgan. Um, Sean is, I think, probably known to just about everybody in this room, uh, has really been kind of a senior statesman uh, for research uh, in general on this campus. He's been at the University of Colorado for the past decade. He came here in 2006 and founded the Mucosal Inflammation Program, which has grown into an incredibly robust and respected uh, activity. For the past six years, he's served as the vice chair of uh, research, basic research for the Department of Medicine, so he's been involved in touched your, all your lives in ways you may or may not have known about, but he's been on every committee and every advocacy group to support research on this campus, and so uh, it's particularly nice to be able to welcome him today. He's also, of course, had a very robust research program, very well funded for his entire career. Um, and uh, I won't go on with the accolades, but he's, he's had a really marvelous career, um, first at Harvard uh, for over a decade before coming back to Colorado, which is actually his home. John, nice to have you here. <laughs> uh, uh, Craig, thanks very much. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I've probably spent more time at this podium than anyone just introducing speakers. Uh, so I'm on the other side of the... Uh, other side of the uh, coin today. Um, so, uh, so we're going to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about uh, a switch from a tissue that has, uh, that's full of air to a tissue that has no air, and that's the gut. Um, it, so, so we know that this is one of the few uh, places in the gut, the gut lumen is one of the few places in the body where there really is no air, there is no oxygen, and anaerobic bacteria will grow. Uh, so we bec we've become interested in this um, really from uh, from years ago, uh, uh, broad broad questions about metabolism. And we were often surprised, uh, in looking through the literature, we were often surprised 
at how really how little was known about overall metabolism of tissues that became inflamed. So our model disease, and I, I would say that many of these principles really apply to, um, to most inflammatory sites. Um, the one exception may be the lung, and I think it's interesting to consider uh, the, the, the role of oxygen in these metabolic processes, but the one exception may be the lung. But the disease that we're interested in and that we model in the lab is inflammatory bowel disease, so also called IBD. Uh, consists uh, primarily of two uh, major phenotypes, uh, Crohn's disease, in which um, Crohn's disease is a disease where lesions can occur from literally the top to the bottom and many uh, extra intestinal manifestations, but classically in the colon, uh, skip lesions and very, very severe uh, small intestinal disease. Whereas uh, shown on the right here is uh, ulcerative colitis. And ulcerative colitis is a disease which occurs predominantly uh, in the colon and is pr predominantly in the distal colon. So two uh, very different diseases, but a similar uh, sort of uh, pathogenesis. And as shown here, it's really a kind of a, a tripartite disease, uh, both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So first, you notice um, that there are certainly genetic uh, traits that contribute to this disease. Unfortunately, no single gene describes this disease. Uh, there are currently um, 250 different genes that have been implicated, primarily from GWAS studies. That's, I think, a caveat. Um, as most of us know that, that work in uh, any of the genetic fields, GWAS studies can be revealing but also very confusing. But uh, there's now 250 different loci. That's, as a, that's probably as of yesterday. I don't know about today. But 250 genes, very complex heredity. We also know uh, from multiple studies, including twin studies, that there likely is an environmental trigger. And this environmental trigger may be luminal antigens. Um, one of the hottest topics in this field, as, as there are, are in many fields, is the microbiota. So sig certainly significant interest in understanding how does the microbiota shift during this disease? Does it, is it causative or is it uh, a result of the disease? And then finally, we know clearly that there are immune components. Um, Th1 versus Th2 immunity. Uh, this was really one of the model diseases in understanding Th1 and Th2 immunity. And then um, most widely, the, one of the more widely accepted therapies for uh, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is TNF antagonists. So clearly there is a component that, um, that involves likely a uh, difference in immune response. And this has brought about, of course, a lot of interest from uh, pharmaceutical companies. That currently, there are more than 90 drugs in trials uh, for inflammatory bowel disease. So, um, <clears throat> so taking that into consideration, if we take a more microscopic look at the disease and we contrast uh, the appearance of these diseases uh, to the healthy tissue. So on the left, you see the healthy colon tissue in which you have uh, these large voids, which are goblet cells, uh, these uh, very well-established crypts, and very few cells in the lamin appropria. If you contrast that to, to ulcerative colitis shown on the right, a few things that you see. One is you get uh, very dominant breaks in barrier. You see fewer goblet cells, and you see lots and lots of infiltrating cells. Now, ulcerative colitis is a disease that occurs from probably multiple episodes of acute inflammatory responses as opposed to maybe the more chronic inflammatory disease, but, but it becomes a disease that, that is interesting to study from a, a standpoint of metabolism. Why is that? So the cell that you see here in the center of the screen, this is termed a crypt abscess. I'll talk about this in a second, but this is essentially um, a profound migration of primarily neutrophils that migrate from the lamina propria into the lumen of the gut. So remember that this is, this is really the outside world, and large numbers of cells have migrated across this break-in barrier into the lumen of the gut. So we know from multiple studies that uh, as the tissue becomes inflamed, there's a tremendous increase in energy demand for that tissue. The response to an inflammatory uh, to, to inflammation as well as responses to infectious diseases requires a, a, a quite significant increase in energy demand. We also know, and I will talk about this in a second, but, these, but leukocytes, in particular neutrophils, can use more oxygen per cell than any cell in the body, including cardiac myocytes. And I'll talk about this in a second. 
And then finally, um, uh, the vasculitis that's associated with both acute and chronic inflammatory diseases decreases oxygen delivery to these tissues. So it made sense a number of years ago for us to begin to think about what is central to these metabolic processes and is oxygen metabolism important and does it contribute to this disease? So, uh, so for the last um, 10 years, we've been re really trying to understand how is it that oxygen metabolism um, influences this disease process? So the first question is, are these tissues hypoxic, right? So one of the cardinal signs of a tissue is that it, it's red. So you would ex expect increased blood flow to these tissues. And then, in fact, they're not hypoxic at all. In fact, they may be hyperoxic. So we set out years ago to, dis to, to determine if this was the case. And we took advantage of this, um, this monoclonal antibody, which recognizes two nitromidazole dyes. So these molecules, in particular, we've used uh, EF5, but these molecules essentially are taken into cells passively um, where they form these, uh, where they form an, a, a reactive nitrogen species that under adequate oxygen concentrations regenerate the native compound, exit from the cell, and pass in urine. However, in the presence of a lack of, in the absence of oxygen, when oxygen levels are low, these molecules form a very reactive nitrogen species here that adducts with various macromolecules and cells, and with monoclonal antibodies can be localized to a tissue. So these, uh, this antibody was originally designed to, to identify uh, tumor targets that have hypoxic cores. So we took advantage of this in, um, in colitic tissue. So this is a mouse model. And first, we're looking at a healthy mouse. Um, and immediately, this became interesting. Why? Because, you can, as you can see here, so shown in red, is the localization of areas of tissue that have a PO2 of less than 10. The area you're breathing is a PO2 of 150. So the first thing you notice is that this is quite interesting from a perspective of just physiology. And that is the tips of colonic, or colonic villi are actually quite hypoxic, even anoxic at the very tips. So realize this is the outside of the world, so this is the lumen of the gut where there is zero oxygen. But you see this gradient across the tip of the, of the villi. So we have termed this physiologic hypoxia. And this actually has turned out to be uh, important from the perspective of gene regulation. If you then look at this in an animal model of colitis, this is using nitrobenzyl sulfonic acid, you see here that first that the tissue architecture breaks down, but you see that this becomes much more intense and much deeper into the tissue. So indeed, you're enhancing a normal response, and indeed these tissues are hypoxic, or so, we, so using a terminology of inflammatory hypoxia. So at about the time some of these observations were made, we became interested in understanding um, what are the signaling pathways? And one of those signaling pathways elicited was HIF-1 alpha, hypoxia inducible factor. And you can see here just by Western blot that colitis is associated with the strong induction or stabilization of this protein HIF-1. So HIF-1 is in a particularly interesting molecule. Uh, it has this um, a, a very dramatic post-translational modification. So in the HIF alpha subunit, there are two proline groups which become hydroxylated. And under, uh, under conditions in which these prolines are hydroxylated, this molecule gets targeted to the proteasome for degradation by the von Hippel-Lindau associated um, EB3 or E3 ligase. When oxygen is no longer available under hypoxic conditions, these hydroxylases are inhibited, and hypoxia within results in the stabilization of this protein translocation to the nucleus where it binds to HIF-1 beta and drives the transcription of multiple genes. So um, this is a, an interesting and, um, and a particularly relevant uh, molecule. In fact, just this week, the 2016 Lasker Award was given uh, for HIF. Uh, Greg Semenza uh, at Johns Hopkins discovered HIF. Um, Peter Radcliffe discovered the prolohydroxylases. Uh, these molecules here. On the pointer cap. These, hydro these, these molecules here 
and the von Hippel Lindau protein was discovered or, or uh, realized by Bill Kalin at Harvard Medical School. So um, you'll see more and more of this now um, as uh, as this gets pressed. So so then coming back to, to coming back to uh, disease, we asked the question: Is HIF stabilized in IBD um, in bona fide IBD? So here, uh, uh, in collaboration with um, Ed DeZoten at Children's Hospital, we, we took a pediatric cohort, in this case, 25 normal samples and 25 samples of patients with either mild, moderate, or severe disease. And in this case, we had a pathologist score these tissues, and we measured HIF, uh, stabilized HIF, in these um, pathologist, uh, pathologist graded uh, samples. And what you can see very nicely here is that with increasing severity of disease, increased stabilization of HIF. In particular, in, this, in the severe, um, in the patients with very severe disease had very high levels of HIF. So you could then say, well, this is associated with disease, it's pathological, and this becomes essentially a target for inhibition. So is that really the case? Well, <clears throat> it turns out that this may or may not be the case. So one of the things you notice here with these very severe diseases is the accumulation of large numbers of neutrophils, as I mentioned in the first slide. So this becomes a biomarker then for inflammatory disease. So again, this is a tissue in, uh, from a patient with ulcerative colitis in which large numbers of neutrophils have migrated into the lumen of the gut. Now, um, the crypt abscess, as it's termed, is a uh, is really a biomarker. It's transepithelial migration. This is determined uh, very interestingly from essentially the anatomy of the gut. So this is a vascular cast that was done a number of years ago, and demonstrated that in fact at the crypt, at the base of the crypt, is where leukocytes move through the epithelium or move into the epithelium, and this is because of the expression of specific markers or zip codes on the endothelium at the base of this crypt. It's a hallmark of inflammatory disease, and as we've shown, it correlates with disease severity. So are these good guys or bad guys? So you get asked that question um, in a very fundamental way. Um, we've come to believe that this is a good guy, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but we weren't the first to discover this. So in the, before Google, let's say, uh, there was a, a gladiatorial surgeon named um, Gallon of uh, uh, named uh, Gallon of Pergamon, and he had described um, incidents of in in uh, in the Roman gladiator periods. Those patients that formed pus, those patients that had leukocytes in their tissues, in fact, were the ones that healed their tissues. Those that did not uh, did not heal and did not resolve. And he made this observation and became very famous for his statement of good and laudable pus. Unfortunately, he fell from favor uh, when he began to introduce foreign objects into tissues to induce pus, uh, which was the first description of sepsis. So, um, so, so Rick Campbell, um, uh, in, uh, who started off as a postdoc and is now a uh, junior faculty member, he's actually spoken at this conference before, but Rick Campbell had this very provocative hypothesis a couple of years ago and he proposed that the hypothesis that an active inflammatory response is protective in the mucosa through its actions on HIF-dependent pathways. So at the time, this was, uh, I think, a pretty provocative and uh, in some ways a little bit of a crazy idea, but, uh, but as you'll see, this actually turned out to be really an important uh, observation. So what Rick proposed was the following, that Activated neutrophils, I mentioned to you that this is a cell that can utilize oxygen at a higher rate than any other, than any other cell, and that activated neutrophils become localized and become an oxygen sink. That the depletion of oxygen associated with this migration results in the stabilization of HIF. So how is it that a neutrophil uses so much, so much oxygen? In fact, it makes superoxide anion. The way that a tissue uh, Really, uh, uh, the way that a neutrophil kills bacteria, its primary function, in, uh, is through the two electron reduction of oxygen, molecular oxygen through the NOx2 complex, molecular oxygen through superoxide anion, hydrogen peroxide, 
and then ultimately to bleach. And this is how you kill bacteria. And this is a very, very active system. So to cut to the chase, Rick had, Rick had done this, the following experiment. He depleted leukocytes using an anti-GR1 or Ly6G antibody. So we could deplete neutrophils, circulating neutrophils from, an, from, from a, a mouse model. We could deplete neutrophils by about 90%. What he did then is induced colitis in these animals, and he used, in this case, a HIF reporter mouse. So any place you see green is the expression of HIF. You can see it localizes inactive colitic disease very, very prominently to the apical or luminal surface. A vehicle animal, you see some localization here, but very little uh, in this case. So what happens if you deplete neutrophils from these animals and induce colitis? So essentially this experiment Without neutrophils, you see essentially no stabilization of HIF. One of, the, one of the more dramatic responses, one of the more dramatic observations that we've seen. So you see very prominently that neutrophils are the a predominant pathway for the elicitation of HIF. So again, coming back to the question, is this a protective mechanism or is this a pathological mechanism? So you can see very nicely here that localization of HIF this is by immunochemistry. Immunochemistry. You can see here very nicely that the localization of HIF within the, epi in, within the epithelium is dominant compared to control patients. So to do this, we developed a mouse model in which we knocked out intestinal epithelial HIF, one alpha in this case, and proposed the ex uh, and, and essentially performed an experiment where we elicited HIF, elicited colitis in these mice. And at this point, it really was an experiment. We did not know what the results would be. But monitoring body weight, uh, colon length, and intestinal permeability, which is, of course, one of the prominent functional responses in the epithelium. In each of these cases, the HIF1-alpha null animals uh, resulted in a, right, in a quite significantly increased um, uh, disease process. In fact, many of these animals in this case died uh, during the induction of colitis. So this suggested to us that HIF was in fact um, a protective mechanism, transcription factor that was elicited that was protective under these circumstances. So uh, a couple years later, um, we then began to think, is it possible then to stabilize HIF at a tissue level and elicit a protective response. And to do this, we developed inhibitors of the enzymes that degrade HIF-1-alpha. So I talked, so Peter Radcliffe had discovered the PhDs, the prolohydroxylases. Those enzymes could be targeted. The way we did this, so the PhDs were um, originally discovered, uh, as I said, by Peter Radcliffe. PhD 1, 2, and 3 are highly, highly conserved uh, uh, molecules between mouse, rat, and man. And the way we did this is we targeted these molecules with either oxoglutarate mimetics, so this is the cofactor here is oxoglutarate, or using iron chelators. In this case, the PhDs are iron-containing proteins. By chelating those iron molecules, they can no longer bind oxygen, and this functionally inhibits these molecules. So one of the commercially available molecules is DMOG, and this has been used widely then to study the PhD inhibitors. We worked with a company uh, in San Francisco uh, to develop some molecules, and in this case, the FG compounds 4497 and 4442. And you can see here that just by looking at uh, reporter assays, that at submicromolar concentrations, these molecules stabilize HIF. Uh, in the presence of oxygen, that, or in the presence of hypoxia, this becomes enhanced. The structure of FG4497 is shown here. It's an isoquinoline-based um, molecule that functionally blocks the PhD through the chelation of iron. So what do these do in vivo? Well, in vivo responses to these HIF stabilizers, uh, you can see here that by giving uh, either IV or oral FG4497, that plasma EPO levels go up, that hemoglobin goes up, and that hematocrit goes up. So these are molecules that regulate EPO, obviously. EPO is one of the targets. It's actually a HIF-2 target, but it's a very, very prominent target. HIF was based on its uh, regulation of, originally discovered based on its regulation of EPO. So, um, so we had to be careful, some of these initial experiments, because we saw hematocrits of 60 to 70 in some of our mice. The people that like these are these guys here. Um, 
Uh, it's been termed oxygen in a pill. Uh, the first three athletes have been busted with these drugs uh, as they become more and more available. There have been a couple of runners and even a race walker that was busted uh, uh, for taking these drugs. So the Olympic committees know about these molecules. But uh, so, so if we go back to our colitis models then, uh, just by monitoring body weight, uh, this is one of many pieces of data, but just by monitoring body weight, the first thing you notice is that the severity of disease is quite significantly diminished, and the recovery from disease is quite significantly enhanced in the presence of these molecules. Histologically, this can be shown here. Uh, here are vehicle-treated animals. TNBS colitic animals, you can see the structure of the tissue is uh, quite significantly changed, and uh, in the presence of this drug, while not normal, clearly uh, these molecules uh, show a favorable response uh, in this mucosal inflammatory model. Uh, so, uh, so we have not been the only ones to, to make these observations. It's now uh, multiple papers over many, many years that have suggested that the lack of epithelial HIF1-alpha, the use of PHD inhibitors, all appear to be uh, protective in the, um, in the mucosal tissues. And how do these do these? I'll just summarize this with, the, with this final table, and that is there are many, many target genes uh, for HIF in the mucosa. Some of them are very unique to the mucosa. For example, uh, some of the molecules that Chris was just talking about, MUC3, which is one of the inducible mucins in the gut, and cross-linkers of mucins that promote barrier function. We know that adenosine metabolism, so molecules, or rather the enzymes in particular that regulate adenosine metabolism are strongly regulated by HIF. Uh, tight junction proteins, uh, xenobiotic transporters, uh, a number of leukocyte uh, adhesion molecules are important. Uh, uh, creatine kinases, some of the defensins and some of the integrins. So these are all uh, target genes that have been demonstrated, documented very well to be if target genes in the gut. So I'll finish here with a model that we believe that uh, adaptation to metabolic changes in the gut is probably very, very important in, 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 uh, in inflammatory disease, particularly under inflammatory, uh, this terminology of inflammatory hypoxia. So one model suggests that as leukocytes move into the tissue, they consume oxygen, lower this oxygen level at the level of the tissue, elicit the response to HIF, and we think that the primary function of this um, transcriptional regulation is really to promote barrier function, to pr promote healing of that tissue, and we think that this is really a, a therapeutically targetable uh, pathway uh, in the intestine. So the people that did the work, um, uh, this is an older picture of the lab, of course, but uh, I mentioned Eric Campbell, Louise Glover, a number of these people are sitting in the crowd today and then all of our collaborators uh, from throughout the world. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, you know, in the gut, which is actually a pretty mature field for stem cells now, uh, in the gut, it's actually su there's surprisingly little known. Uh, we have all of the mouse models right now, and we have uh, um, samples up and going. I think based on, probably at least based on our initial observations, uh, HIF-1 and HIF-2 may be somewhat redundant. So knocking out one, um, there may be compensatory pathways. The one thing we have noticed is, you should, is if you knock out the heterodimeric partner, HIF-1 beta, that the cells cannot be passaged. So it likely you can establish, it seems that you can establish stem cell cultures, but they probably cannot be passaged. So that's a pretty good indicator. Uh, we don't know uh, the basis of that, the molecular basis of that as, as of yet, but, um, but clearly, uh, you know, I think you work in the bone marrow, where the, the bone marrow is also one of the more metabolically active tissues in the body. So I think uh, uh, clearly that's, uh, that's an area that's important. 
Uh, well, to be very honest, it's uh, and very, uh, probably uh, um, uh, it's good thing is HIF is actually a really hard molecule to inhibit. It's much more easy to state, much more easy to stabilize it because you can inhibit an enzyme. Uh, the, when, when HIF was first discovered, uh, it was thought to be probably the savior. It was thought to be it's going to be a silver bullet because it because you could target HIF and then block cancer, starve a tumor, kill a tumor. That has not proven to be the case. So there really are not, I would say, effective HIF inhibitors out there yet. Uh, lots of screens being done and lots of pathways being targeted, but most of them have proven to be pretty nonspecific. Thank you very much.